If you could have the power to heal any disease and only attract good fortune for the rest of your life, to what lengths would you go to acquire it? Would you venture into a serpent's nest? The Druids believe that one could find such power on the day that snakes congregate, a belief that is still present today in Romanian folklore. It is said that, once a year, snakes gather at the roots of a sacred hazel tree and create a precious jewel with magical powers, the Adder Stone. But finding it is rather tricky and dangerous. My name is Radiana, and I shall carry you beyond ordinary reality on a quest to find the legendary Adder Stone, unravel its connection to the mythical archetype of the snake, and learn how it is used in Romanian folk magic. Scattered across diverse cultures, the mystical artifact is known by many names. Snake Stone, Viper Stone, Snake's Pearl, Black Stone or Serpent Stone. Whether fashioned from animal bone or natural rock, the stone held a peculiar reputation as a folk remedy for snake bites across African, South American, Indian and Asian traditions. Meanwhile, in ancient European traditions, notably Celtic and Baltic, the stone is often referred to as a serpent's egg, druid's glass or an adder, hag or witch stone. It can take many shapes and forms, but it is typically described as glassy, with a natural hole bored through. While it was also believed to cure snake bites in the past, its main purpose was to protect against evil forces and grant magical powers to its master. Pliny the Elder claimed that the other stone was revered among druids, writing, There is a sort of egg in great repute among the Gauls, of which the Greek writers have made no mention. A vast number of serpents are twisted together in summer and coiled up in an artificial knot by their saliva and slime, and this is called the serpent's egg. The druids say that it is tossed in the air with hissings and must be caught in a cloak before it touches the earth. The person who thus intercepts it flies on horseback, for the serpents will pursue him until prevented by intervening water. This egg, though bound in gold, will swim against the stream, and the magi are cunning to conceal their frauds, they give out that this egg must be obtained at a certain age of the moon. I have seen that egg, as large and as round as a common-sized apple, in a checkered cartilaginous cover and worn by the druids. It is wonderfully extolled for gaining lawsuits and access to kings. It is a badge which is worn with such ostentation that I knew a Roman knight, a Vacontian, who was slain by the stupid emperor Claudius, merely because he wore it in his breast when a lawsuit was pending. Like in Pliny's insightful account, the other stone's origin is consistently linked with the mythical archetype of the snake across diverse European traditions. According to some beliefs, the stone is forged from the saliva of serpents massing together at midsummer, their piercing tongues crafting the holes within. In other beliefs, the other stone is said to come from a serpent's head or is fashioned through the sting of an adder. This motif persists even in Romanian tradition, where the tale remains remarkably similar. Known as the jewel stone or snake's pearl in Romanian folklore, the other stone is said to be produced by snakes once a year, typically on the Feast of the Cross, celebrated on the 14th of September. On that day, snakes gather the roots of a hazel tree and make a foam from which the precious stone is formed. Those who have seen it described it as a ring, shiny, solar, the pale color of lemon, with small blue circles in two places and a slightly lighter circle in the middle. It is said that it can cure all illnesses and bring good luck to the one who finds it. However, if the stone were to be swallowed by a snake during their congregation, that snake would grow wings and thus become a dragon. According to ethnologist Tudor Panfile, at night that flying dragon can be seen crawling like a snake, his eyes are black, his face is as red as hot iron, he has white, round, fish-like scales that cannot be burnt by fire, and his color grows darker and darker towards the tail. In some areas, this dragon is also conflated with other folkloric personifications of the mythical archetype, from the cloud dragon or Balaur in the Scolomans legend, to the anthropomorphic Zmeu, Flyer, or the more evil one, also named the Witching Hour, who hides himself during the day in the hollow of a walnut or hazel tree, emerging in flight only at dusk to cause mischief and visit sleepless women. Some believe that the other stone of Romanian folklore is none other than the Getty of our native ancestors, named Gete by the Greeks and Dacians by the Romans, who, like the Celts, had a rather druidic religion. According to Jacques Collin de Plancy, 
Gedi was a marvelous stone which, in the opinion of the Gete, had the virtue, when soaked in water, of changing the air and of exciting winds and stormy rains. This description resonates with the folk belief that snakes swallowing the stone became the cloud dragons of weather forgers, storm wizards and students of the Scholomans, whose legend draws from Dacian storm gods and Chthonic cults. Both the Dacians and the Celts seem to have shared a unique belief in other stones and their magical powers. We do know from various sources that they exchanged sacred knowledge in ancient times, since a large population of Celts migrated to the current territory of Western Romania, so today's Transylvania, which was the center of Dacian territory. When Alexander the Great invaded the Danubian lands in 335 BC, he found Celtic tribes that already lived in Dacia. Likewise, Herodotus in the Histories and Caesar in the Gaelic Wars described the Dacian and continental Celtic societies as being formed by a tribal federation of many diverse clans held together by shared basic beliefs and habitual rules. In both cultures, women were free and played a powerful role. The two worshipped different gods, but both performed similar religious rituals and perhaps shared a similar belief in other stones. Whilst the Gedi of our ancestors seems lost in time, in Romanian folklore, the Adder Stone is a recurring motif found in ballads and fables, and it continues to hold spiritual and magical significance for witches, healers, and those who seek its power. But there is more to it than meets the eye. It is not merely a piece of rock with a hole in it used in folk medicine, nor is it a fabled artifact only found in fairy tales. It is a token of the archetype mostly associated with it that of the snake. As Mir Chaliade wrote, the power of such stones never originates in themselves. They share in a principle or embody a symbol. They express a cosmic sympathy or betray a heavenly origin. These stones are the signs of a spiritual reality beyond themselves or the instruments of a sacred power of which they are merely containers. And so it is fair to say that the other stone of Romanian folklore is a container for the magic of an otherwise forgotten snake god. Whilst in the Christian view the snake is at once a symbol of cunning, wisdom, wickedness, deception and death, across universal folklore, the snake is an archetypal and rather holistic symbol of all four elements. It lives on earth or in water, its venom has the properties of fire, and its mythical representation as a winged dragon links it to the ether. It is considered a primordial being and personification of chaos across many cultures. It is likewise a symbol of immortality and health due to its skin shedding and hibernation cycles. It is a sacred totem of peace, prosperity, protection and procreative power, represented as a house spirit among the Romans and other European cultures. In Romanian tradition, it is forbidden to speak the name of the snake or harm it on specific dates, most notably the Feast of the Cross on the 14th of September, when it is said that snakes retreat underground after massing together, and the Feast of St. Alexius on the 17th of March, when it is said that they are released to come to the surface of the earth once more. These orthodox feasts coincide with the natural hibernation cycle of snakes around the autumn and spring equinoxes. Their appearance and disappearance from the face of the earth, thus marked by two important astronomical events, have not gone unnoticed by the people. On the contrary, it secured the observance of snakes in the folk calendar with dedicated traditions throughout the year. In folk beliefs and tales, the snake appears as an archetype whose origins come from an archaic mythical background that was passed through a lengthy process of generalization, amplification of essences, and accentuation of psychological motivations with connection to heroic archetypes. The widespread motif of the hero antagonized by a snake is particularly attested in ancient epics where the snake is likened to a hyperbolic allegory of evil, as it drains the life force of the hero or devours them. At the same time, the snake represents a specific existential condition, foreshadowing the hostile elements of nature and social life. We see this in Romanian ballads and tales where the confrontation not only takes on major epic tones, expressing a culmination of bravery and sacrifice, but also establishes the snake as an archetype of ambiguity, specific to all fundamental symbols and a vivid illustration of the annulment or merging of opposites in archaic thought. In the ballad of Milia, the hero falls asleep under a blooming tree and dreams a beautiful dream as a snake dragon, with scales of steels and gold, enters his chest. As the snake poisons and coils around his heart ever tighter, he suffers greatly and pleads with his loved ones, his father, mother, brother and sister, 
to reach with their hands into his chest and remove the beast. But they all refused him, saying that they'd be better off without him than their own hands. With each refusal, Melia's suffering is amplified until he finds his beloved wife and pleads with her as well. Without thinking, she immediately reaches into his chest and pulls out fistfuls of golden scales as Melia realizes what true love is. In this ballad, we find several mythical motifs, such as that of the Axis Mundi or the cosmic tree under which Melia sleeps and dreams, and where the snake enters his chest. It is a place of initiation, a point of intrusion of the other world into ours. Here, Mila is integrated into a mythical space where his emotions and experiences are amplified. In this context, the snake becomes an initiatory figure and, according to some scholars, a personification of Sabazios, worshipped in some Thracian cults as a snake god of vegetation and fertility whose most impressive rite of initiation involved putting a snake over one's chest before pulling it down to the procreative region. We see the same archetypal ambiguity in the ballad of the snake. In this tale, the hero refuses to suckle from his mother, crying incessantly for three days. Unwittingly, the mother curses him, saying that if he doesn't drain her milk, the snake will drain him. Upon hearing this, the hero stops crying and suckles the milk. However, the snake hears the mother's call and nestles under the house. No matter how much he suckled, the hero grew in a month, while the snake grew in a week. And after ten years, the snake appeared at the threshold with eyes gleaming like the sun and left to wreak havoc in the world. Careless, the hero lay down in the shade of a beautiful cypress tree until an angel whispered in his ear that his years had passed and the curse of his mother, who gave him to the snake, had caught up with him and he had to battle with it. Armed with his mother's weapons, the hero set out to fight, but the snake devoured him halfway, with the weapons protecting the other half. After three whole days of struggle, a horse rider happened upon them and answered the hero's calls for help. The snake told the rider that the hero belonged to him, but unyielding, the rider split the snake in half and took off with the hero. The snake followed them through fire and storm until, eventually, it caught up with them. The rider told the snake it should not devour him for he was innocent. And the snake replied that it was innocent too, for the hero was given to him by his own mother, and so was his fate to be devoured. Without hesitation, the rider split the snake into three, leaving only the head. When the head woke up from the attack, it said it would eat the rider if it still had a belly, but, accepting its fate, it told the rider to crack its head open, for there were four gemstones inside it that could reward him for his efforts to save the hero. The rider did so, and then washed the stones of blood, which shone like the sun. Returning to the hero, he healed him from the poison, and they became blood brothers. Of course, the true hero in this story is the rider, and once again, we see an ambivalent relationship between him and the snake, but this time, we are also introduced to the other stones as a reward for his initiation in the form of battle. In both ballads, the snake is not a mere antagonist for the sake of evil, but rather, it is a figure of initiation into sacred mysteries. For Melia, the reward was true love, whilst for the rider, for other stones. Both ballads also feature the motif of the cosmic tree, first represented as a blooming tree and then as a cypress tree, inadvertently connected to the snake. It is only after reaching the Axis Mundi so depicted in these ballads that a hero encounters the snake. In the folk tradition, one only finds the other stone after searching under the hazel tree where snakes congregated before retreating underground. The hazel is considered a sacred shrub, a phytomorphic totem of the snake, present through its flowers, fruits, leaves and stems in practices related to the cult of the dead and the ancestors and healing rituals, including folk remedies for snake bites. Whilst it protects and shelters snakes, especially when mating, it also has the power to punish them. It is said that merely touching a snake with a green hazel twig can kill it or prevent its bite. The folklore of the mythical archetype of the snake and the traditions dedicated to finding and using adder stones reveal a symbolism hidden just underneath the surface of fairy tales and superstitions. Namely, finding the other stone involves one's communion with the cosmic tree, 
struggle with the elements embodied by the snake and transcendence of the human condition. Only then can one say that they truly found a magical adder stone, for its power seems to be as great as the effort to find it. Today, adder stones have not vanished from folk imagination. The magical jewels created by snakes are still revered among elders and sought by witches. They are rather rare, but there are plenty who claim to have seen one or to know someone whose third removed cousin has one usually inherited from one of their elders. One notable and rather recent account regarding the other stone comes from poet Ani Brada, who claimed to have seen one among her grandmother's belongings when she was a child. It looked like a shiny bead and she was told that her mother found it in her childhood in the backyard not far from the stables. To the poet's knowledge, the bead is created from the commotion of snakes massing together, from the entanglement of slippery bodies and the mixture of salivary secretions. Once the bead crystallizes, it is carried for a while by one of the snakes at the tip of its tail. On the Feast of the Cross, the snakes enter the ground and the bead remains behind, lost in the field. The one who finds it, the poet says, is at a great advantage, as the bead can be used in various rituals, especially in those related to healing, and also against strigoi and snake bites on animals. In the latter case, the bite site is washed with the water in which the bead was kept, and healing occurs very soon. In her account, the poet also revealed her mother's teaching that, if one wants to acquire the snake bead, on the day of the Holy Forty Martyrs, on March 9th, they must make a pile of twigs from nine types of wood, cover it with nine types of wool and silks, and leave it that way in a field without touching it until the Feast of the Cross in September. Then, so she claims, if you look under the twigs, you will find a snake bead. Another notable account comes from the research of the late journalist Bogdan Lupescu, who met a revered snake charmer in the Apuseni Mountains to inquire about his healing powers. In 2003, he wrote a wonderful piece about the encounter which paints a vivid picture not only of the old man, but also of Romanian folk magic and provides yet another alternative for the origin of the other stone. It reads as follows. The old man's eyes are like two fallen stars in the caves of his eye sockets, small and damp, resembling a snake's, for he has disenchanted against snakes throughout his life and the bite of serpents he has healed for seventy years through the power of his words. He is known for his gift across the Transylvanian mountains and even beyond throughout the country. Thousands of people bitten by snakes have escaped death, and his remedy has never failed. Even in his old age, now eighty-three, he is still called the Snake Charmer, Gavrila Pop is his name, known as Gavrila of the White, because he is as white and gentle as a house snake. Twelve sons were born from his frail and slender body, and three of them rest in the cemetery today. Before the old man loses his magical powers, he must entrust the secret of the snake chant to only one of his nine living sons. Only to one. To whom? His sons are worthy in their own ways, but it seems that none of them is made to hear such strong words, none to keep such a great secret throughout life. It is difficult for him to decide and time is short. The words of the snake chant are not a plaything. Once spoken, once learned by another, these words penetrate the apprentice through his ears through his open mouth, and then, in that very moment, the teacher's grace dries up, forever. That's why they can only be transmitted once in a lifetime to a single successor, when one feels at the threshold of death. When speaking about these matters, the old man places his hands on his heart and says, I learnt how to enchant for my grandfather when he lay on his back in bed At the hour of death, he had sons like trees and five grandsons beside him, and of these five he chose and taught only me. My grandfather was ninety years old then, and I was thirteen. 
He made a sign with his hand for everyone to leave the room, so only I remained alone with him. I knelt, leaned my ear to his mouth, and that's when he told it to me, and he said this to me. I chose you because I saw you obedient, submissive, discreet, enduring, much without resisting or complaining. I saw that you will not indulge in drinking because alcohol is the death of enchantment. Only with alcohol does a person's mouth speak ahead of his mind. Now, pay attention. If you learn this enchantment, from now on, you will bring people and animals back to life. But do not make a business out of it. Do not seek to enrich yourself from your power, because an enchanter is not allowed to die rich. You will see and hear many things. When a person sees that his bitten wife, daughter or mother is dying, he will give you a cow from his stable and give you a house just to save her. But you should never take much, just a little. Enough to say you had your part. Heal people and animals and do good. But do not make a business out of your power. And one more thing. Keep this remedy a secret. Because if you teach it to someone else, the enchantment will leave your mouth like a fish. It will no longer be yours, but only the mouth you taught. Only when you feel weak, teach it to a chosen one from your own kin, so that the secret is not lost. And now, the snake charmer becomes weak, fulfilling his grandfather's words. To whom should he whisper the enchantment? This question haunts him day and night. People do not seem as silent as they used to be. They talk a lot about anything, chatter like windmills. His grandfather was not like that. Not a word came out of his mouth without reason. Neither is he. I have been in my life a listener, the old man said. Even if I didn't like what my grandfather or father said, I stayed silent and did not say a thing. I was made a servant by my parents at the age of ten to toughen me up. The master would yell at me like an animal. I was just a child, and he would drive me with the oxen into the forest from the hill, from the village, and back to his home, ten kilometres on foot, through the woods. I endured and did not say a thing. That's why everyone loved me, and no one ever quarrelled with me. That's why even the old man among five brothers whispered the secret only in my ear. He told it to me clearly, like speaking in a low voice. He told it to me as if telling a story. He lived for a few more days thereafter and then passed away. For a while, no one came to him for enchantments. Only after three months and a day did the first person appear. He didn't know the old man had died and he was tearing his hair out, desperate for his wife who was bitten. He was looking for the old man, but the family pushed me to the front, saying, This is his successor. His name is Gavrila. That's when I started to enchant, for the first time in my life. I went to an old barn behind the house, as the old man had already instructed me. When you enchant, be careful not to be seen by any creature with eyes. Neither human, nor cow, nor hen, nor cat. The snake enchantment is the most potent and no eye should see it. So, I started enchanting in the place of the old man as a poor child at thirteen. The first time, I had to be very careful about the tone in which I uttered the words to say to them, as if reciting a prayer with my whole body, as the old man had taught me, and not to make any mistakes from the beginning to the end. I chanted, and the next day, the man's wife was healed. Although the old man would not give away the sacred chant, he explained that, through his words and voice, he asks his master, God, to heal the snake bite. Likewise, through his word, he banishes the biting snake where no one lives, 
to sliver across the sky like a thin cloud until it completely vanishes. Indeed, said the old man. The remedy is in the word, but it must be a word spoken with the whole body. Don't think it is easy. After a while you must hold your breath as you do when singing, counting from nine to one and back, three times from nine to one and backward. And during that time you must list in your mind all the types of snake bites on earth. If you exhale during that time, the cure is lost through the breath you released. Whilst you hold your breath, you must be able to sing. Sing with your mouth closed. Your insides burn when you sing like this. You sing like a murmur, like a moan. I thus chant over water and when I'm done... Nothing should fall from the enchanted water until the first drop reaches the person or animal that was bitten. The old man's words cannot be written. His words are living, animated things. They are spoken mountains, spoken forests, the flapping of a hawk's wing, the screech of iron on the ground, the panting of a hunted animal, the breath of fire, Dialogues held with clouds, with stars, with the forest spirits, with the bewitched wolves running wild on the hills. Above all, his words are music. Music of the people of the aether, with devilish rhythms, like a rainstorm threat, a burst of laughter at all human weaknesses. Walking through the village, Seeking to hear what people say about the powers of the snake enchanter, I could find in every household someone who owes something to the old man. To some, he saved their horse. Another a sheep, another a pig, another a cat, another a wife. No one dares to speak ill of him. And yet, I ask among neighbours, where do you think this power of the snake enchantment comes from. Most of you all agree that his is a divine gift, but there are some who believe otherwise. They say that there are people who keep in their homes, in secret places, the snake's pearl. This bead is a magical stone, a very rare object. Certain snakes adorned with seven golden rings spit it out from their tails only when they are on the brink of death. They do it only in water, beating it with their tails, struggling in its waves, and from the thick foam of water, in the end, a shiny bead is born, a kind of soul of the snake that emerges from its tail and transforms into an object, into a hard and round ball like glass, fulfilling wishes and healing people. Noble snakes, old snakes, withdraw forever into distant, secret waters, leaving behind, before their death, this material sign that is hard to find, left for the benefit of people in the times to come. In the end, the other stone with its mysterious origins is a symbol of the mythical archetype of the snake whose immortal and healing spirit is channeled in Romanian folk magic. The journey to find it reflects a quest for transcendence, a struggle with elemental forces and a connection to the divine, a journey where the seeker may discover not only a magical stone, but a profound understanding of the mystical realms just beyond our grasp. Until next time, remember, like the serpent's coil, the other stone holds secrets that heal and embroil. Before I go, I would like to thank Krakenford for helping me tell this story and Yume for creating some of the art in the video. Please show them your appreciation in the comment section. And of course, thank you for watching and thank you to my Patreons and Soulbirds for their continued support. Until next time.